Welcome to Chapter 2, Critical Thinking in Cross-Cultural Psychology. The theme of this chapter is to basically express the purpose of how to improve your thinking skills, to teach you to think critically, and to help you think about thinking, which is what we call meta-thinking. So critical thinking is an active and systematic cognitive strategy that we use to examine, evaluate, and understand events. We use it to solve problems, and we use it to make decisions on the basis of sound reasoning and valid evidence. So critical thinking leads us into how we think about thinking, which is what we call meta-thinking. And meta-thinking is literally just that. It is the thinking, the act of thinking about thinking. So we are engaging in a critical analysis and a critical evaluation of the full thinking process. And what that creates is meta-thoughts. And meta-thoughts are just like meta-thinking. Meta they are literally thoughts about thoughts. So they are the thoughts that you are having about the thoughts that are already in your head. And all of this encompasses those principles of critical thinking, which is really important when we're talking about cross-cultural psychology because of the fact that it encompasses so many different cultures and things are so vastly different sometimes and not necessarily universal, we have to be able to critically think or we kind of become stuck with tunnel vision. So the first part of critical thinking is the bias of language. So when we talk about language, it serves many functions. And one of the most common and most important purposes is to help us describe phenomena. So it helps us describe events, situations, and people. For example, it'll help us describe what is it, uh, what does it do, those kind of things. But the other thing it does is it helps us evaluate. And it will help us evaluate the same phenomenon that it's using to describe. So think of, is it good or is it bad? So instead of just what is it, once we figure out what it is, is it good or is it bad? So these words are going to both describe and then they're going to evaluate. Now, let's take an example from the book. When we look at the book, the example is that they use is hot and cold. When we're talking about material substances, both of these terms literally refer to temperature. So that liquid is very cold or that liquid is very hot. But when we use these same terms to describe an individual, they take on more of an evaluative connotation, meaning that person is very cold. This could mean that they're possibly void of emotion. Or that person is very hot, meaning they're very attractive. So what happens is our best attempts at language is really to remain neutral and this neutrality is constrained by the limits of our language. So when it comes to describing people in terms of conducting research, it's nearly impossible to find words that are devoid of that evaluative connotation that we're talking about. We don't have necessarily neutral adjectives that describe personality characteristics, whether it's an individual or an entire group. If you think back to social psychology and you think back to the social traits or um, basically the anagram ocean when we're talking about openness, conscientiousness, etc., what we're looking at is it's one or the other. There is no really neutral adjective. Take the E, extroversion. You're either extroverted or you're introverted. Now, you can definitely be somewhere in the middle, but there's not really a word that's going to describe that neutrality or putting that person in the middle. This is table 2-1 from your textbook, and it's really important to take a look at this because what it is is it is two people 
using their perspective, so two completely different perspectives, and they are describing the exact same person. So it you need to kind of take a look and notice how the words reveal each person's subjective point of view and how it ends up being biased and how our language ends up being biased. Another subject that we need to talk about when we're talking about critical thinking are differentiating variables. There's usually two types of variables when we're talking about any type of critical thinking. There's dichotomous variables and then there's continuous variables. So with dichotomous variables, this is where we can take a variable, any variable, and we can place it into either of two discrete or mutually exclusive categories. So an example of this, the light switch is either on or off. The light switch can't be half on or half off. It has to be one or the other. A coin flip can only be heads or tails. There is no middle ground. An individual was either born in Rwanda or he wasn't born in Rwanda. So it's one or the other. There is no gray area here. With continuous variables, this is going to be any variable that's going to lie along a dimension, a range, or a spectrum. And this is instead of being in a discrete category. So basically with continuous variables, they can take on theoretically an infinite number of values. And these values can be expressed in terms of quantity, magnitude, or degree. So an example of this, between the extremes of black and white, there exists a full middle ground that comp comprises many, many different shades of gray. So this is figure 2-1 in your textbook, and it shows the difference between dichotomous variables and continuous variables. So you can see up here with a dichotomous variable, it's one or the other. There is no middle ground. Whereas with a continuous variable, there's definitely a full range or a full spectrum that the variable could fall on. It's not going to be one or the other. This is exercise 2-2 in your book, and this is not something you need to do or turn in. But what we're kind of showing here is whether a variable is dichotomous or if it's continuous. So an example up here, let's look at the first one, feminine and masculine. This is obviously a continuous variable. When you, you can be extremely feminine, the, the one end of the spectrum of femininity, one end of the spectrum of masculinity, or anywhere in between. With power on or off, this is dichotomous. It's either on or off. It can't be in the middle. Married or single. There's sometimes a little gray area here that people will argue, but technically it's either you're married or you're single in terms of legality. Conscious or unconscious. This is going to be continuous. There can be a full spectrum of consciousness and so on and so forth. So you can take a look at exercise 2-2 on your own um, to just kind of take a look at the dichotomous and the continuous variables. But this just shows how some are one or the other. It's very rare that they're going to be both. Additionally, we have similarity and uniqueness in critical thinking. And that's the big thing that we're looking at in cross-cultural psychology is we're looking to see how cultures differ in certain items and how certain items are universal to all cultures. So let's take a look at this first question that's in your book. Which of the following four words does not belong with the other three? So our four words here are Canadian, Italian, Cuban, or Hindu. So if we take a look at these, 
The correct answer to this question is D, because Hindu is the only term that represents a religion rather than a nationality. However, dependent upon how you think about this question, the answer could be B, because none of the others describe anything European. The answer could be C, because it's the only answer that has a communist government. Or the correct answer could even be A, because Canadian is the only word on the list that contains an even number of letters. So it really just makes a difference on how you critically think of the question. And everyone's gonna think of things differently. So what happens is we have these similarities and these differences. And these similarities and differences are between pretty much any set of events. And it's going to be completely dependent on the perspective from which you choose to view them. So, so dependent upon how you view it is basically how you're going to come up with the answer to that question. Now, the solution to this paradox is going to lie in our mindset because how we initially approach the problem is how we're going to evaluate our response as well as how what perspective we're going to see that from. So when we're comparing and contrasting any two phenomena, we have to ask ourselves in what ways are they similar and in what ways are they different. And this is extremely important in cross-cultural psychology. So let's continue on with the similarities and uniqueness, contrasting and comparing different phenomena. So if we look at these two, we can examine the interlocking processes of comparisons and contrasting phenomena. Now, how do we determine to what degree the phenomena is similar? Well, first we begin by looking at any two phenomena and deciding how they share at least one fundamental commonality. Well, they're both phenomena, so they're going to overlap there. With this as your starting point, you then may be able to compare along a virtually, basically infinite array of dimensions, ranging from the broadest of universal properties to the minutest of mundane details. So two examples are depicted here in the Venn diagram, and this is figure 2-2 two, two in your book. In interpreting these figures, you can note that the overlapping areas are going to indicate the commonality between the two phenomena. So a relatively large area of overlap, which is seen here in this top figure right here, is going to indicate that there are more similarities than there are differences. Whereas a relatively smaller area of overlap, as seen here in the bottom figure, is going to indicate more differences than there are similarities. Another topic we need to look at in terms of critical thinking is what we call the Barnum effect or Barnum statements. So a Barnum statement is basically any generic one-size-fits-all description or interpretation about a particular individual that is going to be true of practically all human beings. So an example from your book is Roberto is sensitive to criticism. Okay, this is a generic one-size-fits-all. Pretty much all human beings could potentially be sensitive to criticism. So what they do is they actually take these statements and they de-Barnumize them. So in this case, Roberto is particularly sensitive to criticism, meaning he and he alone. Another one, Native Americans have an appreciation for nature. The de statement here is compared to people living in modern industrialized societies. Native Americans display a greater appreciation for nature. If you take a look at page 42 of your textbook, it's going to give a lot of different Barnum descriptions for you, as well as de descriptions. 
But what happens is this creates the Barnum effect. And this is a phenomenon that refers to people's willingness to accept uncritically the validity of Barnum statements. So people just assume automatically that they are true. Assimilation bias is another topic that needs to be covered in critical thinking. So when we talk about assimilation bias, first we have to talk about schemas and bias. So schemas are a cognitive structure or a representation that is going to organize one's knowledge, beliefs, and past experiences. And it's gonna provide a framework for undertaking new events or future experiences. Basically, it's a general expectation or preconception about a wide range of phenomena. Now, one of the most fundamental and pervasive of all human psychological activities is our propensity to categorize things. We tend to categorize everything from people, objects, places, events, even concepts, our feelings, experiences, our memories. So what we do is we conceptualize all of these and we put them in categories as mental representations or schemas. So in the cross-cultural domain, schemas can include perceptual sets about people based on age, gender, ethnicity, nationality, religion, political affi affiliation. So any characteristic we can possibly think of. What happens is sometimes with these schemas, we end up with a bias. And what a bias is, is it's a prejudicial inclination or a predisposition that's gonna inhibit, deter, or kind of prevent an impartial judgment. This leads us to assimilation bias which is the, the propensity to resolve discrepancies between pre-existing schemas and new information in the direction of assimilation rather than accommodation, even at the expense of distorting the information itself. Now, when we talk about assimilation and accommodation, these are two complementary processes that we're gonna utilize in different situations. Accommodation is gonna to refer to the process where we modify our schema to fit the data. So our general expectation or our preconception is gonna be modified in order to fit our data. So we're gonna change our pre-existing beliefs to make room for new information. With assimilation, we're gonna actually modify the data to fit our schema. We're going to incorporate new information into our pre-existing beliefs, even if it means that we're gonna distort information itself. So do we, as people, as human beings, make appropriate use of assimilation and accommodation? The answer is usually no. Instead, we get this bias that manifests itself, and it manifests itself in a wide variety of forms and contexts. And this is because our schemas bias our perceptions of reality, and it does that to make it consistent with what we already believe. In addition to assimilation bias, we also have representativeness bias. What we have here when we're talking about representativeness bias is we have to have heuristics first. So when we make decisions in situations, we normally would involve conducting an analysis of the problem, collecting relevant data, testing various hypotheses, then draw appropriate inferences, thoroughly evaluate the pluses and minuses of all the possible outcomes, and then arrive at the optimum conclusion before we take any final action. And that's pretty much what we do in any type of critical thinking. But in everyday life, we're actually unable to take our time in making these decisions like that. So instead, we have to make these very rapid judgments 
And when we make these rapid judgments, we do so without thoroughness or accuracy. And so that leads us to the heuristics. The heuristics are a mental shortcut or a rule of thumb strategy for problem solving that reduces complex information. It reduces time consuming tasks to a more simple, rapid, efficient, judgmental operation, particularly in reaching decisions under conditions of uncertainty. And that leads us to representativeness heuristics. This is the cognitive strategy that we have for quickly estimating the probability that a given instance is a member of a particular category. And this is used to identify phenomena in our environment by intuitively comparing the phenomenon in our mental representation. So we're attempting to ascertain whether there's a match on the basis of whether the phenomenon's features are similar to the essential features of the category. And if there is a match, we tend to conclude that we have successfully identified the phenomenon. And if not, we continue our cognitive search. So an example that your book uses is that Ted A is Jewish because he looks like your prototype of a Jewish person B. Or that Jane is a lesbian A because she behaves like your stereotype of a lesbian B. Now we use this representative heuristic for identifying everything from ideological categories to causal explanations. But what happens here is again we have bias we tend to make accusations based on certain behavior, prototypes, things that we think of. So this leads us to the representativeness bias, which is any condition in which the representativeness heuristic produces systematic errors in our thinking or our information processing, just as seen in the two examples I just gave. Those were definitely systematic errors in how we process or think about things. And finally, we have availability bias. With availability bias, we have to start again with a heuristic, the availability heuristic. And this is a cognitive strategy for quickly estimating the frequency, incidence, or probability of a given event based on the ease with which such instances are retrievable from memory. If the examples are readily available in our memory, we tend to assume that such events occur rather frequently. For instance, if you have no trouble bringing to mind examples of X, you are likely to judge that it's common. By contrast, if it takes you a while to think of certain illustrations of why, you are prone to conclude that it's uncommon. And that brings us to our availability bias, which is any condition in which the availability heuristic produces, again, systematic errors in thinking or information processing, typically due to highly vivid, although rare events. Our fundamental attribution error, how do we explain these causes of people's behavior? So we typically attribute their actions either to their personality or their circumstances. But if we put it another way, we tend to make dispositional attributions or even situational attributions. This creates the fundamental attribution error which is a bias in attempting to, de de ugh, sorry, to determine the causes of people's behavior that involves overestimating the influence of their personality traits or their characteristics while underestimating the influence of their particular situations. So basically overutilizing the internal attributions and underutilizing the external attributions. Finally, with critical thinking, you need to realize that correlation does not prove causation. And this is something you'll learn in every single research methods class. 
anytime you have a research methods chapter, you're going to have this. So a correlation is a statement about the relationship or association between two or more variables. And what they do is they enable us to make predictions from one variable or event to another. So this does not establish a causal relationship between the variables. We cannot come up with any type of causation. And this is because when we have correlations, we can have a correlation where between A and B, where A may cause B. You may have a correlation between A and B where B causes A. The correlation between A and B where they cause each other or a correlation where something completely out of the ordinary, a third, a third relationship or a third variable causes both. We refer to that as bidirectional or multiple causation. Bidirectional causation is where you have a mutual relationship between two variables. Basically, it's a cause and effect of each other. And then we have a multiple causation. And what this means is there's not just one cause. You can see down here, there's gonna be several causes. And finally, in critical thinking, we have the belief perseverance effect. Through all of this, through all of the heuristics, through all of the biases, what happens is we have the belief perseverance effect, which is the tendency for us to cling stubbornly to our beliefs, even when we have contradictory or disconfirming evidence. And what happens here is we're unable to change how we believe, even though all of the evidence is showing us something different. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed chapter two. Please reach out and let me know if you have any questions.